I've lived in Northeast Portland my entire life. Going up around Alberta Street, you hear stories of how things used to be. You hear about how this neighborhood was predominantly African American, that it was gang territory, and had a higher crime rate. Looking at the neighborhood now, you would never imagine it that way. There are self-titled urban Pilates studios and vegan cafes all down the street. I know that it mirrors a type of change seen all over the country. It's called gentrification. Its symptoms, lucrative properties and community revitalization gained at a mortal cost, the displacement of longtime residents. Portland is the fastest gentrifying city in the country and the topic is too close to home not to talk about. Videographer Sawyer Montgomery and I looked into it. Why did this neighborhood become the way it is and what are the implications for the remnants of displaced communities? We decided to start with someone who knows the housing industry. We met with real estate agent Joshua Scher at a Northeast Portland home he sold earlier that day. It's basically a 2-1 in the Alberta Arts area. You know, usually in the 4s and 5s, that's kind of like the starting point. I try to save the homes. I try to find buyers that buy these homes that are historic homes that will renovate them. In the neighborhood with some of the new construction is that it's number one, they're eyesores. They're just these monstrosities that take over the neighborhoods. Since our inventory is so low, the supply isn't there. And so people are bidding up on these houses and paying way more than asking. A big question around gentrification is the intentionality of it. In the early 2000s, Metro, a local government that presides over several regions, including the Portland metropolitan area, turned to Eco Northwest for a report on how to increase urban density. Eco Northwest, an urban planning and consulting firm, recommended raising land prices as the best way to do this. Those um, neighborhoods that used to be crack infested and there, there was um, abandoned buildings. So that is the thing that people don't like because no one wants to live in a neighborhood where you don't feel safe and you're not, and you don't feel like you're a part of the community. So gentrification on the revitalization end is good because no one wants to live in that kind of a situation. But on the displacement side is when you come into those neighborhoods, a majority of those neighborhoods are um, neighborhoods where there's people with lower socioeconomic situations and are people of color. So a lot of them are displaced out because they cannot afford the, um, the higher increases in rent and just trying to live there and the livability of that neighborhood is not um, financially accessible for them. So it's funny, you know, we're talking about gentrification. A lot of these guys that we find here in a lot of these shootings, they don't live here anymore, right? They have an aunt or a grandma that lives somewhere kind of nearby, but they still want to go hang out in the park. They still want to have that ownership and sense of belonging to the hood, they claim. So they'll come here and like barbecue and hang out, and patrol, and uh, they end up, you know, getting into shootings. Wait, let's talk about this a little bit. Yes, the neighborhood was more dangerous back then, but the vast majority of families who lived here weren't involved in gang activity at all. The city talked a lot in the 80s and 90s about revitalizing the neighborhood, but they never followed through until the gentrification had taken hold. If there was a young black man who may have um, considered himself to be gang affiliated and he was out doing something bad in, in, in his neighborhood, that there would be other parents that would tell them like, hey, you need to go home, or they would call their parents. So there was that sense of community where that person would, that person, even if they were doing something bad, they knew that they would have to face consequences. I think that since gentrification, these people don't feel like they can, like this is their community anymore, that they are less likely to listen to the person who may be on the street because that person on the street's not there anymore. Right now we're at my grandma's house. As a kid, I would always come here and just play with my cousins. My auntie had that house next door. My auntie moved out. They had completely redid that house. The house looks brand new. The house is next door we used to own, but we sold. The lot, which was still empty, uh, the two houses, but they weren't built. It was like a lot. Like when I would come down here over summer, it like slowly just start, people would start leaving. And like some of the friends I made were gone. Like you see like Salt and Star, uh, Little Big Burger, and you just see like houses behind that. Like they make a house turn into like a little store. I just, yeah, I think it comes in my head like, is it gonna be bought out? Is it gonna get torn down? I've been the manager of the Waffle Window Alberta for over a year now. We originally started the Hawthorne in 2007 and then they opened up this one, 2011. We 
see a lot of different ethnic backgrounds in here. A lot of tourists come in here. Now that I'm working here, it's like I'm all about community and reaching out. Because like I lived here for three years, right? Before I even knew that the waffle window existed. Sometimes I go places and I feel like the minority because it's all Caucasian people, but it's like you're in my neighborhood. It's confusing to me like why these people are coming in and taking over, you know, these nice $300,000 homes. All it's doing is getting rid of people's homes. It doesn't mean that the community is getting stronger, richer, or healthier. So something's got to give on that. I hear so many people saying they're moving away, which I don't know where you're going to go. I mean, it's, it's happening throughout the whole United States. So wh where do you run to next? Who knows how many different changes this whole area will actually go through before it's all said and done. You know, I grew up in this neighborhood and you can't go to people's neighborhoods anymore and see those families anymore. My have times changed. I mean, there are people that contributed to it. Uh, the city of Portland, the housing bureaus, development agency, all of this. They could have done a better job back when, but just the case itself, you can't stop. Now, if you're a good city, set of managers, commissioners, and so forth, you would have bureaus doing things way back when. It's too late now, it's already happening. They're gonna have it where you're gonna have to pay to park. I heard they're gonna have it where you're gonna have to pay on Alberta here. Well, there you go. I have a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> Try to figure out how to, how to sustain here, Mr. Brooks. I might have to move to, to, to Hawaii and live on the beach, live off the lands. Move to Arkansas and just hunt. <laughs> My family lives down there and all they do is hunt and fish and, and live life. At the bus stops, I've seen people probably lived in like richer places. People we'll walk by and just stare at the like the African Americans. It used to be a very cultural neighborhood. It's not very cultural no more. And we do get a lot of offers saying out. I don't like that. They're just trying to buy people out that have been here for years. The old lady down the street, they did that to her. I don't agree with their members, but yes, I do like the change. We're like the only Hispanic, and there was once there was a right across the street from us, some white people lived there, but everything else just got literally moved out. You know, you, you can't, you don't want to live here before. Now everybody wants to live here. You can walk your family at nighttime, and you, I guess you. I don't know. I don't know what's positive. If, if you're rich, it's good to live here, but if you're not, then there's you slowly getting kicked out. You know, if you can't afford it, then you just gotta go. I moved here September of 1970. At one point, uh, this, this was pretty, pretty much predominant black neighborhood. This was the hood the kids called out, I put it like that. Most of the people over here was afraid to even come out of their house. My house was shot up a couple of times, you know? I didn't move. Why didn't you move? I ain't scared. <laughs> Bud Clark, he helped, he helped. I got together with him, and he gave us some resources, and we pretty much cleaned it up. Got Emmanuel, five minutes from Emmanuel, five minutes to the Lord Center. Anything you want is right in here. This is valuable property over in here. I saw, I saw it have $32,000 or something like that. That's what they give them for their home. That was the problem, they didn't listen. Now they squabbling. They didn't take, they, ain't nobody took their homes away from them over here. You're the one that sold out, you know? Uh, I, I was offered, what, 350 here about six months ago. 350,000, that, that ain't no money. Matter of fact, another guy came here the other, yes, a couple days ago. He's looking at the house, I said, how much you give me for mine? He said, I'll give you 450 right now. That tells me something. There's two aspects, there's two ways to look at it. You hate they doing it, but it's, it's paying off for me by me staying here. You know, it, it's really paying off, you know. Um, I'd say probably in the next year, this house will be at a half a million dollars. Sound like a lot of money, don't you? No, I know it. That's why I ain't going nowhere. I'd probably be dead, but I'd leave it for my kids. Gentrification doesn't just impact demographics and statistics. This isn't about economics or housing prices. This is about people, their lives, and their stories. 
the changes in this neighborhood were performed with little regard for long-term residents, many of whom are people of color. People who want to buy a bigger house or start a new business aren't bad people, but they're contributing to an issue that is too large to ignore. Fault lies within negligence by higher-ups, city planners and government officials who allowed this to happen. What's done is done, and now it's time for this community to reflect. We must ask ourselves, will we continue to push community members to the wayside, or will we find ways to make things more affordable for everyone and make sure diversity in our neighborhoods becomes a real priority? It's time to take a stand for our community, my community, because I'm not ready to leave it behind.